<laughs> Matt, Matt, Madam Speaker, I, I apologize for not for not rising. I'm still working on my new knees. Uh, I'm honored to rise tonight on one of the most important debates we've had in this place in the time that I've been a member of Parliament. I'm extremely, um, I'm on the horns of a dilemma, Madam Speaker. First, I want to acknowledge that I'm standing in the traditional territory of the people of the Al uh, Algonquin Nation and acknowledge that, it, that uh, their patience and tolerance with us is indeed generous, and I say miigwech. This is a very difficult debate, and it's difficult for many reasons. And one of them for me is that I have not yet decided how I will vote. Neither has my parliamentary colleague from Kitchener Center. We are looking deeply at the Emergencies Act, the implications of it, the downsides which are evident, and the need for it which remains a question. I, I want to say that this is going to be more legalistic than usual, Madam Speaker. I'm essentially going to go through an exercise of statutory interpretation and compare it with the facts and see where we are. So I'm actually grappling with two questions tonight. Um, you know, how do, how do we vote, but also how do we analyze the legal questions? Um, I think in this debate today and over, I know from 7 a.m. till midnight tomorrow, the day after and the day after and part of Monday, we are going to hear debate which is not grounded in statutory interpretation, but in which a, a lot of emotion and a lot of charges and counter charges will be heard. Both sides have generously festooned this debate already with wedge issues and red herrings. And I think as Canadians, and certainly the citizens of this country, need to know what we're talking about, and I'll do my best to bring it home. The first question is, well, what is the Emergencies Act? Uh, I, I, it's very important to say that it is not the War Measures Act. The War Measures Act, as used by the current Prime Minister's father, Pierre Trudeau, in the FLQ crisis, was an egregious violation of rights and freedoms right across the country. It was a suspension of civil liberties everywhere all at once. It was directed against people of Quebec, even people with no connection whatsoever to anything radical, but merely political opponents of the government of the day who were rounded up. There was an official apology in the last session of Parliament. We understand that, by the way, when the War Measures Act was invoked in the 1970s, police in Vancouver rode into peace camps and started beating people up because civil liberties were gone right across Canada. You didn't need to have a reason. This is not that. This is the, res res uh, the work that I would have to say impresses me of reflective parliamentarians gathered in 1980s when they had no imminent emergency that, to which they had to respond. They looked at public welfare like a pandemic well, how would we respond to that? Would we need the Emergencies Act? And what kind of emergency would it be? They looked at war, they looked at natural disasters, and they looked at this, which is what the government has invoked the declaration on, that we're debating tonight, is out of the public order emergency category. But when they did that, they made it clear, this act by its very language means the military can't be called in. By its very language, it says the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will be honored. And very much unlike the War Measures Act, it creates parliamentary oversight, part of which we're doing here tonight, that within seven sitting days of the government, any government using its declaration for an emergency, parliament must debate the matter and vote. And Parliament will have a committee to continue to oversee what takes place under the Emergencies Act to make sure it conforms to the law. Twenty members of Parliament and ten senators at any time during the 30-day life of this emergencies declaration can gather and request that we debate this again and vote again. So in a minority parliament, this does suggest that the executive, in other words, the cabinet and the prime minister, do not have the power to call the Emergencies Act. Obviously, they've done the declaration. It's in effect right now. But there's parliamentary oversight, something that was not present under the War Measures Act. This is described as a public order emergency. And what that means under the Emergencies Act is, quote, an emergency that arises from threats to the security of Canada and, both things must be met, and that is so serious as to be a national emergency. 
Now, in, in analyzing this definition, it turns out that the words threat to the security of Canada are not the words that one might take as a plain meaning that we think through for ourselves, what's a threat to security. No, it's, it's specifically described as being the meaning that you would find in the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act. So you go to another act to find the definition for threats to the security of Canada. This is fascinating, and I think I may be the first one to mention this. Threats to the security of Canada in the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act is defined with four heads to describe it. To save time, I'll read only B, because I think that's the one that most applies in this circumstance. Includes, threats to the security of Canada means foreign influenced activities within or relating to Canada that are detrimental to the interests of Canada and are clandestine or deceptive or involve a threat to any person. Now, the second part of that definition that we get from the Emergencies Act itself says that not only must it be a threat to the security of Canada, such as the one I just read out in definition from the Security Intelligence Service Act, it must also be so serious as to be a national emergency. National emergency, we go back to the Emergencies Act, national emergency which people have referenced this house, is an urgent and critical situation of a temporary nature that A, seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians and in a, is of such proportions or nature as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it, or, not both, or seriously threatens the ability of the government of Canada to preserve sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity of Canada. So the question here is, has that test been met? Has that threshold been met? And that takes further interpretation based on the facts. I personally, and I found this in the declaration itself, uh, so the government is also troubled by this, am troubled by the foreign influence aspect of what we're seeing across Canada. The declaration which we're debating tonight includes this point. Quote, the protests have become a rallying point for anti-government and anti-authority, anti-vaccination, conspiracy theory, and white supremacist groups throughout Canada and other Western countries. The protesters have varying ideological grievances with demands ranging from an end to all public health restrictions to the overthrow of the elected government. Now, Madam Speaker, that does seem very consistent with our first question. Is this a threat to the security of Canada under the meaning of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act? Foreign influenced activities within or related to Canada that are detrimental to the interests of Canada, such as blocking access to trade, blocking communities, shutting down communities. And are they clandestine or deceptive? You bet, if the money's coming from overseas, and people use anonymous email addresses, and they send money into Canada for the purpose of disrupting our nation. Now, what is that purpose? Where do we find further evidence of what foreign influence might be attempting to, to, attempting to visit on Canada, but also on other political regimes? This is from today's Associated Press how American cash for Canada's protests would sway U.S. politics. And in this, a series of journalists working for Associated Press make the case that this convoy and the various protests across Canada under the banner of Freedom Convoys is, quote, really aimed at energizing conservative politics in the U.S. and elsewhere. Republicans think, says the article, Standing with protesters up north will galvanize fundraising and voter turnout for the midterm elections. No wonder we have such luminaries of the, of the far right south of the border as Texican Republican Ted Cruz and Georgian Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene calling the protesters in Canada and not just the heroes, heroes and patriots. They are the darlings of Fox News right now. And Senator Rand Paul says, quote, he hopes the truckers come to the United States and clog up their cities. In other words, I think one aspect of what may raise this to the level of national emergency is that it also has tentacles that longer it goes on here, the more it's intended to inspire disruption in other economies, including our number one trading partner. Does it rise to the level of a national emergency? 
This is a harder one for me. Does it rise to the level of a national emergency? We have seen blockades being removed. They were geographically easier. There were fewer people. The logistics of the Ambassador Bridge compared to what's going on right now outside this place, and I will disagree with colleagues in this place who've said, if we're here in Parliament, that means it's safe. That is not the case. Friends of mine in this place and members of their staff have had feces thrown at them as they go back and forth to work. We've had people yell at us and abuse us as we try to go through the streets. And being that at the moment I'm someone with a disability, I can't get here at all without protective service protection and assistance. So no, it is not our usual Parliament Hill. We do not feel safe here. And and going back to the, uh, to, well, going to the next point of evidence that I want to bring before us, I am very concerned about the nature of our safety and security here. We are not just any city in Canada. We are the national capital, and we have attracted a certain type of, and, and, and I'm not going to put a broad brush on everybody who showed up in Ottawa to support the convoy. There are clearly people who are there thinking it's sort of like a street party. There are people there who are not politically radicalized. But the thread that runs through all of this is a radicalization with an inherent threat of violence. That came forward more clearly than anything from The Guardian today, a very chilling article by a Canadian reporter who I must say I've known for years, but my goodness, Jason, Justin Ling is distinguishing himself in this crisis as someone who actually goes out and does reporting, digs up information. Today in The Guardian, here's the headline. Canada was warned before the protest began that violent extremists had infiltrated the convoy. Now, the Honourable Member for Medicine, Medicine Hat, Carson Warner, made this point earlier today to, to excuse the protest. He said it's not their fault they were infiltrated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the article in The Guardian today from Canadian journalist Justin Ling, quote, assessments of the Canada's Integrated Terrorism Assessment Centre, known as ITAC, which includes the Security Intelligence Service Canada, CSIS, ITAC reported before the convoy got near Ottawa that, quote, the convoy organizers advocate, quote unquote, advocate civil war. Convoy organizers hold up the U.S. January 6th insurrection against a fair democratic election, promoting the lie that Trump was, that the election was Trump's and it was stolen from him. They hold that up as their model. The CSIS and the uh, ITAC warned according to Justin Ling, warned the city of Ottawa police that this was the nature of what was coming to Ottawa. It wasn't a secret. <laughs> they left with great fanfare to drive across the country. Uh, when this is all over, we'll have to find out what happened within the chain of command in the Ottawa police to ignore these warnings. Some officers, not all necessarily, all but welcomed the convoy. There are reports from uh, local um, Ottawa journalists that when they interviewed truck drivers, they said, well, we only planned to stay a little while, but then the police told us we could go park on Wellington and we wouldn't have to leave for a very long time. Oh None of this had those truckers, not been truckers, but indigenous people coming to assert rights mm -hmm. on indigenous territory. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been allowed to get a single stick into the ground to construct a single thing before being arrested quite quickly? Had they been people of color? Had they been environmentalists? Or my goodness, look at how we treat camps of homeless people moving in brutally. They didn't need the Emergencies Act to knock over lots of homeless people in lots of brutal police takedowns. Well, we know right now that there is an intention on the part of many of these convoy participants to not leave. I don't want to worry about every social media crank that puts things up on Twitter, but I know that Freedom Convoy social media says, get downtown to Victoria, we're gonna take the legislature and we're not gonna lose, and we're not gonna leave until all the mandates are gone. Forget public health advice. We are going to demand that the government goes, the mandates go, who knows? It also was reported in this article about warnings from ITAC that they thought that the use of vehicles, trucks, fuel 
could present a real significant threat of violence. And all too often, those of us here in Parliament have wondered and asked other security forces, does anyone know what's in all those trucks? We don't know. So I think we have clearly a situation that is allowed to become intolerable and dangerous, but I'm still not comfortable voting for the motion, and I'll tell you why. The emergency measures regulations, as described, are overly broad. When the Prime Minister said this was coming forward, he said it would be geographically circumscribed to the specific areas where we see that, we're, that normal authority, lines of authority, protections for public life and health are missing. We have an emergency, that's clear. But why does this, which was promised to be very limited and specific, the emergencies measure regulations, define infrastructure as basically everything, and then say this applies right across Canada. This designation of protected places under section uh, six of the regulations is far too broad and applies for all of Canada. Now, that is a concern I have. I also know that I've heard many people ask, we need clarity. At what level of financial donation or financial support of illegal activities does your bank account get seized? I highly doubt that the government of Canada plans to seize the bank account of anyone who made a $20 donation on GoFundMe to the Freedom Convoy. I doubt it. I think we're looking for proximate connection, the kind that will exert the pressure that makes the convoy go away. Where's the pressure points? Insurance, finances, registration, chance to make your living as a trucker when this is all over. I don't think they intend to go after a $20 bank account, but I have not heard them say that. I am not comfortable voting until I see more clarity that circumscribes the overly broad reach of the regulations. I'll also say that I hear from many, many people, virtually all the time, how do we know that this won't establish a precedent that allows a crackdown on civil liberties? I want to read one more section into the record very specifically. For, this is from the Canadian Security Intelligence Services Act. In the definition that has been transplanted into the motion we're debating tonight, what is a threat to the security of Canada? And it says at the bottom of the paragraph, of which I've only read subsection B, it does not include lawful advocacy, protest, or dissent, unless carried on in conjunction with any of the activities referred to above. So I feel quite secure that if the emergencies, if I'm again, and I don't plan to get arrested again, it, it wasn't fun, I was way outside my comfort zone and the judge hated me. So I, I got a much more significant fine than my friend who's now the mayor of Vancouver. Uh, I don't plan to go out to get arrested again. I believe that nonviolent civil disobedience is a vital part of our democracy. It has its roots all the way back to Henry David Thoreau in the 1800s. It was then picked up by the exemplar of nonviolent civil disobedience, Mahatma Gandhi, and then taken up by Martin Luther King. There are reasons that in a democracy we must have peaceful protest and the right and the ability to break the law if you believe that law to be unjust. But that does not include the right to destroy other people's lives and livelihoods in the process. That does not include a right to, in your own actions, refuse to take the consequences, refuse to say, I will go quietly with you, officer. That's the essence of what I did when I performed nonviolent civil disobedience, what my colleague, the Honorable Minister of Environment, did when before he was in office, he also believed that something as important as the survival of life on Earth and the climate crisis was worth giving up your own sense of safety by submitting yourself to arrest. These are complicated matters and complicated questions. And I would beg of all of us, we must listen to each other. I am so concerned that so many of my constituents believe this is actually a peaceful protest out there. They think it is. There's nothing peaceful about hunks of metal taking over your city. Trucks do not have charter rights. Honking a horn, as the judge said in granting the injunction, is not an expression of free speech. These trucks should have been stopped before they got anywhere near the center of our national capital. They weren't. That's what constitutes the emergency. 
but I need the government to show me that the regulations will be tightened up before I can vote for this. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the government, to the Minister of Attorney General uh, and, and the yeah, Attorney General, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, I'd like to thank our colleague uh, for the very insightful uh, presentation, as, as always. Um, and I, I do uh, just want to assure her uh, that, um, that the, the oversight that she's looking for, the uh, certainty that she's looking for, is, is certainly there within the regulations. Um, this is meant uh, to target individuals who are breaking the law. Um, and, and of course, there's an issue of proportionality as well as reasonableness that's, that's embedded in, in the regulation. And I, I do invite her to, to, re, to reflect on that. Um, it is uh, important to distinguish between those who may have innocently uh, or, or donated um, w without the, the right intent and those uh, who obviously uh, have, have donated with the intention of, of uh, breaking the law. So I, I just want to remind her that there is an element of reason reasonableness that is already embedded uh, in, in the regulation. The Honourable Member Sanish Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I say to my Honourable Colleague, the Prime Minister Secretary, read the emergency measures regulations. There is no certainty in here. There is no precision. It's far too overbroad. I mean, I, I could read into the record critical infrastructure and how it's defined uh, to include ports, piers, lighthouses, canals, tramways, bus stations. But I mean, this is, this is not in any way specific to the circumstance we're in right now, and that's what makes me um, have, have a, a good deal of, of resistance to voting yes, while I do think we need to do more because we have a current emergency. Uh, questions et commentaires, the Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate my member's uh, intervention tonight and appreciate also the, the pain that she's in and certainly hope she's well soon. Uh, Madam Speaker, the Order and Council released by the government authorizes the government to do the following, and I think this would certainly add to the member's concerns around certainty. So I will just uh, quote what is in uh, the Order and Council. Other temporary measures authorized under Section 19 of the Emergencies Act that are not yet known. So the government is authorizing itself to do things that essentially ask this House to hand him unlimited authority. And we've seen in the past in matters such as the documents from the Winnipeg lab that the Prime Minister has little or no respect for parliamentary oversight, the SNC-Lavalin scandal again demonstrating his lack of respect for independence of our justice system. So. How does she feel about adding that particular section uh, of the order in council to her list of reasons why she would be very apprehensive about supporting this emergency act? The Honourable Member Sanish Gulf Islands. Thank you to my colleague from Yorkton, Melville. Yeah, I, I think that the fact that we have the next, I guess, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, most of Monday, we have the opportunity over the, what has been a day today and over the next four or five days the opportunity to find what's wrong here in terms of what would make members of parliament who understand something must be done about what's currently happened, which is not that the city police didn't have the original jurisdiction which could have prevented this, but where we are now is a uh, entrenched, well-funded, well-supported uh, effort to, and successfully, shutting down the center of Ottawa, and I feel successfully menacing the parliamentary procedures in this place. We have an opportunity through this debate, and I hope that government members will come forward and say, all right, that order in council, we didn't mean, but let's clarify this. We're not going to say that we have given ourselves a blank check. Uh, the member um, from, um, uh, one of the members, for, uh, forgive me for forgetting the riding name, and I don't want to say his name out loud, made the point from the NDP from Quebec that this, ce n'est pas un, un chèque blanche. This it's not a blank check. But I think it could be tightened up so that we actually know exactly the limits of what we're about to approve. And they should be geographically confined as well as specific to the circumstances. The Honourable Deputy de Edmonton. Member for Abitibi Kimiskanai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank my colleague from Saanich Gulf Islands for her speech. I recognize her as being one of the strong. Uh, defenders of democracy in this house. She was very constructive and nuanced in her intervention. 
We haven't heard a lot of constructive dialogue from the government lately. And I think it's unfortunate to see that they're using such a radical measure as this Emergencies Act. So I'm wondering, how, does my co how would my colleague uh, understand the demagogy and arrogance of the government in invoking this act? The Honourable Member for Sanish Gulf Islands. Merci, I thank my colleague. I agree with him on the issue of um, the rhetoric that we've heard on both sides of this debate. I don't think that's something that helps society find a solution. I don't think it will help unify our country or our provinces. And I'm disappointed by the level of speech. I don't think that we should be demonizing the people on the other side of the debate. In all debates in Canada, we need to show respect for each other. That's essential. That's one of the things that defines Canada. We're not a country that divides w with dog whistles. The Honourable Member, a single there, just uh, so we can get to other questions. Questions uh, and the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Madam Speaker, and I, I have to say, Madam Speaker, over the last couple of days, I've heard, uh, first of all, inaccurate and complete anti-Indigenous racism in the rhetoric around what is going on outside. This is not a peaceful protest. This is an illegal occupation. And to be stigmatized within what's going on out here is, is absolutely damaging and violent to Indigenous people from across this country. I want to um, I read uh, the Honourable Member something very quickly. And, and it says it's from the... Um, a guardian from Arwa Mahawi, and this is what she writes. She says, there's a lot going on in the world right now. If you're not a Canadian, then the protests in Ottawa might not be uh, the, the top things you're worried about. But I'm afraid you should be worried. You sh should certainly be paying attention. What's unfolding in Ottawa is not a grassroots protest that has spontaneously erupted out of the frustration of the local, um, local lorry uh, drivers. Rather, it is Astro, an astroturf movement, one that creates an impression of widespread grassroots support where little exists, funded by global networks of highly organized far-right groups and amplified by Facebook misinformation machine. And I just want to end off, we know that the soldiers of Olden and the Yellow Jackets are involved in this. They are posing a threat to our democracy. Our democracy is under threat. So I'd like to, uh, Madam Speaker, through you, caution the member uh, to referring to Indigenous people as examples when we're talking about an alt-right, white supremacist movement, f fueled and funded by the white supremacist movement uh, on the other side. I'm wondering if my honourable member can agree that that is not a... The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. And thank you to the honor my Honourable Colleague from Winnipeg Centre. I made that point earlier today to the member for Regina Capel, who was trying to say that somehow it was hypocritical that the government didn't crack down on Wet'suwet'en, whom he referred to as protesters. Those were Wet'suwet'en, hereditary chiefs with legal rights derived from the Constitution of this country and Supreme Court of Canada decisions. There's, I couldn't agree more with what she said, and I'll just add nothing to it except to say thank you, thank the Honourable Member for making those points. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for La Salle, La Chine, sorry, Dorval, La Chine, La Salle. Brief question, please. Speaker, and I would uh, like to say thank you to the Honourable Member for her speech, which is always eloquent. I think we all learned a little bit something from her today. Uh, quickly, I'd like to ask, what should a responsible leader, Prime Minister, wait for before uh, declaring an emergency? What kind of egregious harm should befall a country, its citizens, before we do something, or do we... Stop it right there. Thank you. 
The member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Brief answer. I feel as though the city of Ottawa and many Canadians are in the situation of a battered wife where the police say, but has, has your husband used a gun on you? Has he hurt you yet? That we are menaced by an occupation yes. and we don't want to wait any longer to have this problem solved. Mm -hmm. We found guns in coots. Yes. We know that this group has been infiltrated by the alt-right global network mm -hmm. to which the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre referred earlier.